Well, thank you guys again for being here. Today we conclude the Great Commission series. It is your mission should you choose to accept it. And I had a weird week uh, this week. Um, I'm a routine kind of guy. And by the way, I spilled water on my leg. So you in the first, first few rows, it's a water bottle. I don't want anybody pointing out. There may be a day when that issue is more, but not today. Okay, it's just, just a water bottle. So um, this week, uh, my wife and I decided to do something a little unusual, kind of crazy. Uh, I've mentioned to you I like coffee, I like caffeine, and, and um, I drink a lot of it. And so I have said from time to time to people, well, every once in a while I get off coffee, just to show that I can. And I said that to somebody last week, and um, I realized it had been 10 years since I had actually put my money where my mouth is. So I got up Monday morning and said, this is the week I will get off coffee forever. Caffeine, not forever, but for a couple weeks. Um, and so my wife, she says, well, I'll do it with you. And that's what married couples do, right? You suffer together, right? You diet together, you withdraw from caffeine together, you, you know, and uh, she said, I will do it with you. And I said, great, won't it be fun to have somebody doing it with me? Now, something you don't know about my wife. Um, now, if you know her, I mean, she's easy to work with, she's the team player, she's the nicest person in the world, she's sweet, all those things are true. But one thing you may not see or know about my wife, Joy, is that she is really competitive. Um, Joy is a first child, uh, oldest child, I'm an oldest child, and my wife does not like to lose. Now, I'm not telling you that I don't, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm the same way, kind of. And so when we sometimes do things together, sometimes it turns into a competition. Well, this week, Monday and Tuesday, turned into a competition. How much caffeine did you have? Oh, I beat you today. I had less caffeine than you did. And on Wednesday, both of us are struggling with our caffeine withdrawal headaches. Not a huge, I mean, we're not going, you know, having to go to rehab, but I mean, having a headache, right? And, and we looked at her and she looked at me and she said, why are we competing with each other? And I said, I don't know. And she goes, we got to help each other with this, don't we? And I said, yeah. And so we made a decision, a pact. We had a uh, compromise, a treaty, a peace treaty. We said, the only way we win is when we both win. When we both make it through a day without a caffeine withdrawal headache and we both go all day without caffeine, then we win. And we decided that we, instead of competing with each other, should work together to win something um, as a team. And to me, it represented church exactly. Because oftentimes, we try to compete with other people. We, when we decide that we're going to do church really good and get really good at God, look at the people who are around us and say, all I have to do is be better than you. And if I'm better than you, or I can convince you that I'm better than you, then I'm better at God and I win. But in reality, we're a team. And the only way that we win is when we all win. And when we join together and make sure that each of us finish the race. When one person struggles, we all struggle. And we provide strength for that person who's struggling. When one person rejoices, we all rejoice. We're happy when they have things that go on in their life that are worth rejoicing over. That when we're in it as a family, we no longer compare ourselves to each other, but we compare ourselves to Jesus. And we all realize that we're not really that good at following God, but that as we together pursue Christ, that we're going to win. We're going to get to the end of our life, having supported each other, having reached out to our world, loving and serving them, earning the right to share our faith so that they can have a personal relationship with Jesus and we'll all get to the end of our lives without regret. And that's the Great Commission. That's the mission should we choose to accept it. It's this Great Commission, this mission that's given to all of us, not just one of us, so that each of us will team up together and that we will win together. Now, when I we say win, we're not beating anybody except joining with the Lord as He defeats sin, Satan, and death ultimately once and for all, um, providing salvation for anybody who would believe. And that's the Great Commission. So you and I are going to be finishing this series up today, and it's a very simple message. The message is, what are you going to do based on what you know? I've been asking myself this all week. Based on what I know now, what am I going to do? I asked you last week, I'll ask you again, how is it you have adjusted your life, your lifestyle, to represent this great commission? What have you done differently? Because we as Christians turn the Bible into an academic subject, and we get really smart at God, but we fail to worship the God who wrote the Bible, and we don't worship the things of God by applying the instructions of God. We just learn more about this book that loses its power unless we allow the Holy Spirit to do something in and through us based on those truths. So today, my entire message is going to be pointing you toward a question. Are you going to do what it is that you've learned? Sometimes that's a correction. Sometimes it's a confession. Sometimes it's the adoption of a new habit. It's the conviction to live a different way. 
different for everyone, not the same for any two people. For every application I give you that's a possible application, there's one application I can't give you that might be the one the Holy Spirit is trying to pinpoint into your life. And so I've been praying for you all week long that God's going to speak to you just like He's been speaking to me. And I've made massive adjustments in my life that God has pointed out over the last week and uh, in two weeks beyond just eliminating caffeine. That was just a, a, a dare. That was just a thing. That wasn't the thing that I'm talking about. I'm talking about big, important, deep, life-changing kinds of things. So we're going to look together at the Great Commission one more time after I review the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to glorify God by what? Participating in this Great Commission. What's our mission? Our mission is to equip disciples, to help try to encourage people, to nudge people, to encourage people, to provide an environment for people, us, the people who we're around, who we have influence over, to think the things Jesus would think, to care about the people that Jesus would care about, and to do the kinds of things Jesus would do if He were here living our lives today. That's simple. What is the vision? Well, we want to make sure that we are a church that sees people, these disciple makers, people investing in the lives of others as they go and invite their friends to have a relationship with Christ and begin to grow in their faith. And then they go and invite their friends and nudge them toward the saving power of the cross. And then we have a third and fourth and fifth generation and beyond movement that begins to impact our entire area because people who used to walk with themselves are now walking for Jesus or with Jesus. The three mission possible attitudes we discussed in the first four weeks really got into my business, and I hope they got into your business as well. If you walk out of church without feeling like your feet or your toes have been stepped on at all by the Holy Spirit, um, it's hard for me to understand. Because every single week when I bring these messages, my feet hurt. Because I see things in my life that don't measure up. Availability was the first attitude. Are you available to the Lord? We'll talk more about that later in our time today. Are you a worshiper? We'll define that again today and talk more about that. Are you submissive to the things of God and to the will of God? Which means dying to self and deciding that we're not going to live for ourselves any longer. The mission possible command is really divided into three pieces. The first one we talked about three weeks ago, going into all nations, being in motion, going and doing something, going to where the people are and sharing this gospel. The second is baptizing. We talked about that a lot last week in the message, and many of you have expressed an interest to be baptized. I hope more of you, if you're thinking about that, will decide that November the 10th is the time when you'd like to be baptized. And today we're talking about the third piece to this great commission, to this mission possible, and that is that we're supposed to teach people to obey. Now, before we go out and teach people to obey, we have to obey ourselves. And that's the great hypocrisy of Christianity, is that we oftentimes tell other people what they should do without ever doing it and living it in the first place. And if we measure ourselves against Jesus and not against each other, and we realize that we have a lot to learn, we humble ourselves. And we, taking on this life of a disciple, we follow and we learn. And as we follow, we learn. And as we learn, we follow. And as we learn and follow, we encourage and nudge and teach. And we do this in a group, a team. Because unless we finish together, we haven't won. And so I want to make sure that today that you're doing what it is that you know that we're supposed to do. And that you're embracing this great commission that Jesus left with his disciples and left with us. And the reason that I want this for you is it's the only way for you to find freedom and meaning in this life. It's a paradox. It's difficult to understand. It's illogical to some. The only way to find meaning in this life is by giving your life away. The only way to find true freedom and hope and happiness is by acknowledging once and for all that it's not about me. And by doing that, even though it's scary, Jesus will give you more than you have ever imagined possible. And the life that you lead from the time you make that commitment until the day that you die will be a life of purpose, intentionality. And you'll look back on your last dying day without regret, knowing that you have to look forward to closing your eyes and leaving this biological life behind and awakening to the reality of Jesus when he says, welcome home, you were good and you were faithful. And that's what I want. The other stuff, it's fleeting, it's temporary. It might be shiny, it might be bright, it might make me happy for a season, but it's not real. And Jesus is offering reality. He's offering real hope, real peace, real meaning, and real contentment. So here we find ourselves on the mountain 
we find ourselves after Jesus had defeated death, sin, and Satan by resurrecting from the dead, right before he ascended into heaven, he gathered his disciples, and he said, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, this is what we're being taught in the book of Matthew, to the mountain where Jesus had them to go, that's availability, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted, that's worship, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, that's submission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. There's the first charge in this great commission. Therefore, go. The second, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the third, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, we're not going to have time to talk about that last little phrase, surely I am with you always. But the greatest promise of Jesus throughout the New Testament is that I will be with you. You're not alone. And as you embrace this great commission, this life of purpose that we're talking about and we'll be developing over the next few months and years, you're not alone. Jesus is with you and we're with you. We're a family and we do it together. So we're going to talk about obeying what we know to obey, living the way that we know to live. And for some of you, if you're honest, if you're open, transparent with yourselves and honest to the Lord, you'll find a time when you may need to make an adjustment, where you may need to make a commitment. And I don't want us to leave this room the same way we came in. And so my challenge to you again is to have your mind open, your heart available, and to be ready for Jesus to change your life. We're going to go to the book of James because this is one of my favorite books and it speaks to this issue really, really well. It's the first chapter of the book of James and as the Holy Spirit inspires scripture, the instructions that were given through this book, uh, through the book of James, uh, informs us and not just in how we live, but it gives us specific, specific instructions on in this case, how to understand and what to do with all of the things that we've been learning from Jesus through his word. And so we're going to pick up in the middle of James chapter 1, verse 19 through 26. And this is a passage of Scripture that really I don't have to talk a lot about, even though I probably will. It's one of those passages that if you just read along with me, and you allow it to settle in your spirit, it speaks for itself. And so I won't be explaining a lot of this passage, but I will be challenging you at the end of our time to respond to this passage. But I want to read it and allow it to settle on your spirit. As I read it this week, I couldn't read the whole thing without pausing. I had to pause and allow God's Word to settle over me and feel the power and the weight of it. So I want you to do that with me right now. You read silently, I'll read out loud. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word that's planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet don't keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Ouch. Religion that our God or that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows, or to serve him in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's powerful, isn't it? That's one of those things that you probably could just read that very first, you know, little passage every morning and we'd have a better life. We'd live a better life. We would be much more likely to get along with the people closest to us and possibly all the ones who are not quite so close to us. But it builds on itself and leaves us with an important and powerful principle. And I want to try to explain it to you very briefly. First of all, let's go back to the very beginning here at verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, this greeting is really important. And what this greeting means is very, very simple. I love you. And because I love you, I want something for you, not something from you. And so I'm going to give you some instructions that are going to change the way that you live. 
It's penned by a human author given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's God Himself saying, based on my love for you, I want you to understand what it means. I want you to apply it to your life because I want you to find the freedom that comes when you really choose to live with and for me. My dear brothers and sisters, he's writing this to Christians, to people who have decided to follow Jesus. Take note of this. Everyone should be three things, and these are really important. Be quick to listen. Now, that's stuff that we learn in kindergarten, but some of us, myself included, don't really ever learn. It's combined with another um, sort of a converse point, which is be slow to speak, or maybe that's a complimentary point. A great proverb, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent, and they're thought discerning if they hold their tongues. Even if we're ignorant, people assume we're wise, because we're not dumb enough to open our mouths. So the principle here is kind of a double application. The first one is relational because James talks about conflict among Christians. In James chapter 4, James says, why, why is it you guys quarrel and fight and argue with each other? It's because the things that are lurking within you are coming to the surface and they're causing this conflict. So conflict is definitely in his mind, but it's also responding to the Word of God and the teachings of God. And he says, be quick to listen, be slow to speak. Why slow to speak? Because we can't listen while we're talking. And you can't listen while you're forming a thought before you've heard what it is the other person has to say. And with my kids and my wife, I confess oftentimes when they start talking, I think I know what they're going to say, and I don't always finish listening to what it is they're trying to say. I've formulated a thought. Now for this biblical principle, it's really simple. Settle yourself. Don't form your opinion ahead of time. Don't mindlessly babble, asking God to conform His will to yours. But settle yourselves, be still, be quiet, and allow God to speak to us. And then when He speaks to us, don't become angry. Now this word anger is an important word, and it's not the kind of anger that's an explosive outburst where if I got angry at you because you cut me off on the freeway and maybe I, you know, showed you the peace sign or something out the window of my car. It's not that kind of anger. It's the kind of anger that smolders under the surface. It's the brooding, silent kind of anger that isn't visible to others, really, but you can sense it. The kind of anger that shapes all of the other emotions that keeps you maybe distant from really knowing and being known by the people who are closest to you and others who might want to be part of your life. It's the kind of anger that's the most dangerous kind of anger because the only people who know about this kind of anger are you and the Lord. So it's the easiest to hide, the hardest for somebody else who loves you to correct and point out. Now, in relationships with one another, it's easy to understand how this kind of anger is not the kind of anger that is going to be helpful but the kind of anger that destroys relationships. But with God, it goes much deeper. Are you upset at God? Are you mad at God? Do you have a lurking distrust down deep within your soul? For some people, they do. But for others, it's just sort of a distrust of His Word. It's kind of an irritation at God's law because there are certain things in the Bible that are difficult for us to be able to embrace, to wrap our minds around. There are principles, there are truths, there are ways to live that, well, they're different than the way we want to live. They're contrary to our sin nature. They're contrary to our culture. They're contrary to what our schools teach. They're contrary to what our churches oftentimes teach. And so what people do is say, because God's Word is uncomfortable, because it's not socially acceptable, because it's not contextually relevant in today's world, which I believe, by the way, all those things are false, we're going to discard it, or at least parts of it. We're going to have a lurking, underlying distrust of the timeless truths of Scripture. And whenever these truths begin to irritate me, begin to challenge me, they make me uncomfortable, I'm going to blame the Bible and not myself. So we're being told here to settle yourself under God's Word. And when it becomes uncomfortable, as it oftentimes does, to submit yourself to it, and not to become angry or distrustful, not to let things lurk under the surface. That when it comes time to make a decision, that we don't blame God and blame Scripture and begin tearing pages out of our Bible, but that we allow the Holy Spirit to do that work in us. 
because he's given it to us, not to hurt us, not to take away our fun and our freedom, but to give us true fun, to help us and give us this ultimate freedom that comes by giving our life away. So everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, there are a whole bunch of parallel truths to this. James says that a person who teaches should be extra careful because anytime you stand up and you say this is what God means, there's a double jeopardy or scrutiny put upon you. And so when I teach you guys, I mean, it kind of scares me to make sure that I do my very best to get this stuff right, that it's correct, and that when I present these truths to you, they're what God intended in the first place. And I'd take that seriously and do my very best. Therefore, in verse 21, and this really will step on your toes. And if it doesn't, you're probably not paying attention. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. And humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, I'm giving you some words here. And these words are um, Greek words. And the reason that I'm giving them to you, and they're a lot more detail in your notes if you've downloaded your notes, it's not to impress you. I don't want you to look at the Greek and go, oh, this is so deep. Because it's not. That's just information. Depth comes at the end when I ask you to do something about what it is that you're learning today. Depth comes through the application. This is information, but this is an analogy. And the words here mean something, and they don't necessarily mean the exact same thing in English that they do in Greek. And so I'm trying to help you understand the impact of the analogy. So I want you to track with me here very quickly. And let's look at this word filth first. Immoral thoughts or actions. Now, immorality can be external or it can be internal. And it's very personal. And it's one of the first things that we tell the Lord isn't his business, right? I mean, what's nobody else's business, right? There are a few things that are no one else's business. My sex life and my finances. Immorality goes well beyond our sex life and moral purity. But that's part of it. And it can be external and it can be internal. And the reason that we're told to get rid of it, and this word here is really important. The word that's used is the same word that's used for wax in the ears. Do you ever get wax in your ears? Now, it's not confession time. From time to time, we do. I Q-tip every morning. You probably do too. But, you know, you get wax in your ears. And if you get wax in your ears, what happens? You can't hear. So the appeal here is get rid of this stuff in your life. Because you can't hear God's word. It's wax in your ear. And so then you have to look into your own life and you have to decide, well, what's immoral? Well, Scripture speaks to that. The next word that's used here is evil. Corrupt intentions hidden in the heart. Not always expressed outwardly, but sometimes expressed outwardly. Get rid of all moral filth and evil that's so prevalent and humbly, selflessly, with meekness and gentleness, put yourself aside and accept the word planted in you. Now, this is kind of a cool uh, word picture, too. The word planted is the same, well, it is a word that was used for planting a seed. And so just um, bear with me as I kind of paint this picture. This is what the original hearers of this passage would have perceived. It would be that God, when you were saved, planted a seed in your heart and your spirit. That seed was planted by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. When a person becomes a believer, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within you forever. And His Word is planted in your heart. And then it begins to grow. Now, there is a war that goes on. The Apostle Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. It's a war within your soul where God, through the power of the Holy Spirit and your renewed nature, want this garden to grow. But your old nature, which fights against the new nature, tries to stamp out this garden by planting weeds or by trampling the things the Holy Spirit wants to do. And so the instruction here is that this was planted in you. You've got to get rid of this stuff so that you can hear the word and so that you can allow this garden to grow within your soul and to turn you into the masterpiece that God has in mind in the first place. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted within you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, if you grew up in a King James church, you probably, you know, get the point, but you memorized it a little different way. But this was one of the first passages I remember memorizing as a kid. And it's a really important passage. But I went to a church that didn't really... Um, encouraged me to do a lot about what the Word said. And I've shared with you before my history, maybe yours is similar, but growing in my faith, 
when I was a kid, and even when I was a young adult, discipleship had to do with how many classes that I attended and how much knowledge I put in my head. And as I went from one class to the next and learned one subject and moved to 201 and then possibly 301 and put more and more Bible into my head, I was considered to be spiritually mature. And the more I learned and the more degrees I accumulated and the more proficient I became in discussion groups, everybody assumes that you're spiritually mature. But the reality of it is that oftentimes that we worship the Bible without worshiping the God of the Bible. And the way we worship the God of the Bible is by applying the Bible in the way we live. And there are people all over the place that have big, giant, fat heads full of Scripture knowledge, but don't live any of it. And a person who knows the Word but doesn't do the Word is deceiving themselves. And there's an example or an illustration here about what that looks like. Anyone who listens to the Word but doesn't do what it says is like somebody who looks at his face in a mirror. Now, the mirrors back in this day were rudimentary. They were so basic that you really couldn't see a good reflection of yourself. I thought that might be nice to not know exactly what I look like. I could just look into a blurry mirror and just convince myself that I look a lot better than I do, but they had to work hard to see a reflection of themselves. Mirrors really weren't the way we understand them until the 14th century, but back in this day, they had pieces of metal, uh, sometimes bronze, that were polished. And if you were really rich, you could afford silver or gold, but only a few people could do that. And they polished them the best way they could, but they were still blurry and distorted. And the way you had to look intently, and this is spelled out in the Greek here in this story, in your notes and also on the screens, is that you would have to turn this mirror and catch the light in a perfect sort of way and find the exact spot on the mirror. And it took a little effort to look into it and to stare into it. And then once you got your reflection and you looked, you had to remember because it wasn't guaranteed that you'd see your reflection like that as easily again. And so as we unpack this analogy, as we unpack this example, what this is telling us is that when you look into the Word, to the law of God, to Scriptures, you don't just see yourself looking back at you, but you see yourself with Jesus in control of you looking back at you. The kind of person we're supposed to be, the kind of life that we're supposed to live, who Jesus has in mind looking back at us. And we see this as we look into the law of God. And then if we walk away and forget what we look like, that means we're going to go back to deceiving ourselves. Now, as you might imagine, I don't spend much time in front of a mirror. I don't have to. I don't spend much time in the shower either. A bar of Dove soap does the head, does everything else. I'm good to go. My wife does spend a little time in front of the mirror. She doesn't need a lot of time in front of the mirror because she's beautiful. But I don't think I've ever seen her walk past a mirror where she didn't have to check or correct something, right? There's always something sticking out or something not quite right. And you know, it's like baseball sending signs to third base. There's always just a little correction. And I would be really surprised if she ever just walked by a mirror and she went, oh, Oh, perfect. And then she just kept going. I mean, she could say that, but it would just shock me to no end if she actually did say that. I've never seen anybody do that. And that's sort of kind of what we're talking about here. Who stares into the perfect law of God and can walk away from a church service or a small group or a Bible study class and not say, this is what I'm supposed to look like. I've got to make some changes. I have to respond. Who can say, oh, this perfect. I don't need to change and not have our toes stepped on, not to feel the conviction, the gentle nudge, the correction of the Holy Spirit. If we don't sense that and feel that when we stare intently into that law of God, then we may not be saved in the first place. It's a powerful, powerful analogy and example so, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately, immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the law that what? One of my favorite words gives freedom. Freedom from your past, freedom from sin, freedom from a destiny and eternity in hell. <clears throat> Excuse me, freedom to salvation, freedom to a legacy, to peace, to hope, to a personal relationship with Jesus. And continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it they will be truly blessed in everything they do. Now, I want us to stop for a second, and I want us to apply this. Um, I like movies, and I like some animated movies, but I have a favorite. I've told some of you this um, before. My favorite movie, my favorite animated movie is Happy Feet. Um, you anybody seen Happy Feet? All right, I'm not going to ask you to recite or do anything. I have a niece, a lover, her name's Rachel. 
She was born with Turner's uh, sy uh, syndrome, and uh, she lives in California. And because of her Turner's, she struggles a little bit, um, but she's a beautiful kid, um, smart. I love talking to her on the phone. And I was talking to her on the phone just the other day, and we were talking animated movies. And uh, she had seen Toy Story 4, and I wanted to get a review because Joy wanted to see it, and I didn't want to see it, and I wanted to find out if it was worth seeing. So she was giving me a review. And I wanted to tell her about Happy Feet, because in a way, that's kind of how I see her. Happy Feet, the plot, the short version of the plot is that there was a colony of penguins. And the colony of penguins had done something the same way for a long, long time. Every penguin who was born into the penguin colony had to do things the same way. They had to sing. Everyone was a singer except one little baby penguin, Happy Feet. Happy Feet was a dancer. And all the other penguins who were singers and had it sung for generations and generations could not stand the fact that Happy Pete the penguin was a dancer. Now, I loved that. I've loved it since before I knew Rachel. But Rachel needed to hear it because Rachel's special. And even though a lot of people sing, she dances. But the thing about Happy Feet was society, everyone around them, the world around him tried to get him to stop dancing. But there was no way to get him to stop dancing. When his mom stood on his feet, his mom started dancing because nothing could stop the response that he had to music. Ultimately, he ended up saving the entire penguin colony because, go figure, they needed a dancer, not a singer. I'm going to challenge you to live in a way that may be different than what you've thought, maybe different than the way you thought of yourself. Maybe your identity has been formed or shaped by things that should not have shaped it. Maybe society, maybe tradition, maybe the way you've seen yourself for so long you forget who you are. Maybe you've decided to sing, but God really wants you to dance. And I want to walk you through some things that are a culmination of some of the points we've discussed together for the last six months. Scriptures we've talked about principles that we've addressed, things that I've been trusting that God would work in your life and your heart and your mind about. And this is not a comprehensive list, but it all kind of involves and revolves around these three attitudes that Jesus presented to his disciples on the mountain. Availability, arranging my time, my thoughts, and my money to be available to God. Worship, do I view my life, my entire life, as a mission by offering everything I have, everything I am, and everything I hope to become, to be used by God? Am I submissive? God's in, in charge. He controls all of the information and the circumstances. I'll be obedient. These are some things that may or may not apply to you. I may not hit your thing, but I want in this last three or four minutes for you to be open to the Lord and allow Him to convict you, to encourage you, to challenge you to live differently, and for you to accept that challenge. We're looking deeply into the law as we have been over these last several months, and we don't want to walk away forgetting what Jesus looks like in our life. The first thing is very simple. For some it may not apply because you've already made the decision to follow Christ, but for others it applies. I know that there are some who come on a regular basis to church here, who've not made a decision to follow Jesus, and nothing could make me happier that you've chosen to come and to learn about the truths of not just Christianity, but Jesus Christ and His story. I love the fact that you're here, and I appreciate your courage, the courage that it takes to come to sit around a group of people who you don't necessarily agree with to hear things that you're not sure about yet. But my prayer is and has been that you come to the point where you're ready to take that step and become a child of God, to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to make a decision even right now in this moment. I've heard it, I've seen it, I know it, and I want it. To accept that invitation and to do three very simple things. The very first thing we do is, is we confess our sin. It's a very simple thing to do, but it's very hard for some, and that is that we acknowledge to God that we have fallen short of His standard, that we've sinned. One sin, a million sins, it doesn't matter. Sinful and that we confess those sins and we need to be forgiven for our sin. The second thing we do is we tell God with our thinker that He has installed, you can say it out loud, you can say it in your mind, that you believe who Jesus is. That Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life. 33 years, 100% God and 100% man. Never sinning, never making a mistake. Allowing himself to be put to death on a cross to take on my sin and your sin so that we can be forgiven when we ask for it. Defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all 
by rising again three days later and providing the way for us to have peace with God only through Jesus Christ and his work. The third thing we tell them is, is that we're not going to live for ourselves anymore. We want to live for him. That he's the boss. That our life now belongs to him. That he's Lord. And all you have to do is think that thought to him and mean it in your heart. And he instills the Holy Spirit into your life. Installs the Holy Spirit into your life. The second thing I want to ask you is, have you been baptized? What's the big deal? Well, Jesus said it was a big deal. We talked about that last week. That baptism is a step of obedience that happens after a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ who has an outward profession or response to an inward commitment. Nobody sees your salvation experience unless you choose to share it with me or someone around you. But this is a way for you to identify with the body of Christ and to say, I am one of you guys. We talked about it a lot last week. If you have questions and you weren't here last week, I encourage you to, re to listen to the message online. The last half particularly deals with baptism. Now I'm going to get into our business even a little deeper, and we're going to go through a short list that comes from what we've discussed today and some other things we've discussed recently. And these are questions that I'm asking you, and they're rhetorical questions. Am I struggling with immorality internally or externally? And immoral behavior has to do with a lot more than just sexual conduct. But the Bible talks about what we think about, what we choose to do with our bodies, and the Bible is very clear about how we're supposed to live. We live in a society with a lot of shades of gray, and you have to make a decision in your life what's immoral and what's not. Because if you allow yourself to continue to live within a pattern of immorality, it's wax in your ears. Why doesn't God want us to do it? Because he wants us to be able to hear from him. He wants to speak to us and have us know him, his voice, to live for him. So he wants us to get rid of that so that the wax can come out of our ears and we can have ears to hear and eyes to see the things of God. Are you struggling with it? If so, today may be the day that you confess it and you get freedom from that. For some, it's a relationship. For some, it's a lifestyle. For some, it's addiction. For some, it's a thought life. For some, it's a priority different for everyone, but common to everyone at the same time? Am I having a hard time with unforgiveness, with anger and bitterness? Have I just chosen to hang on to resentment, to hold grudges, to not forgive those who've wounded me or angered me? If you're hanging on to it, you got to let go of it because it is a prison that has trapped you in the past. Satan wants you trapped in your past. He wants you helpless to live in the moment, and he wants you useless living for Jesus. And the way that happens to us, one of the most common and prevalent ways is we choose to live in this past with bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness. When you forgive, it doesn't mean that you're saying that everything's okay. You're giving the person a pass, that you're saying that what happened uh, is something that you can, you know, just sort of let go. What you're saying is that you're giving the offense to Jesus, saying it's between you and them, not me anymore. I can't hold on to it. It's too heavy. And Jesus takes that burden as we cast our cares on him. He does the caring for us. Are we gossiping and slandering others? That's an important one. James talks about it, talks about the tongue. He even discussed a scripture briefly that involves this. But it's one of the ways that we as Christians lose our influence, our ability to share our faith, and destroy our churches faster than any other way. There was one time when I had a friend in a church who just loved to tell stories about people and things that were second, third-hand information. And uh, I said, man, can you stop? I said, your gossip is killing people. Well, I'm just sharing my opinion. I said, who cares about your opinion? People don't need to know your opinion when it's negative, when it's not your information to share. The Bible calls that stealing. And he said, well, it's not gossip if it's true. And I said, well, if it's not gossip, it's slander. And when you slander somebody, whether it's your friend, whether it's somebody in your family, whether it's somebody in your church, whether it's a pastor, whoever it is, you're stealing from them. You're stealing their reputation. You're stealing their integrity, at least as it's perceived by others, their ability to influence and represent Jesus. But we are malicious in this way. And some of us have to stop being so open with sharing our opinions and tearing other people down. The words that we say Every word that comes out of our mouth influences the people who are around us. And God holds us responsible for every single word.
So that's the next one. Let's move on to a different list. Am I preoccupied with appearing to be too spiritual? This is impression management. This is another thing that gets churches, not just our church, every church. Am I preoccupied with appearing to be spiritual? Am I worried about comparing myself to you in a competition with you? If I'm competing with you, then what happens is I'm happy when you fail. And when you succeed, I'm unhappy. And do you know how toxic of an environment that is spiritually when we are looking for other people to fail so we can say, my family's not as bad as yours. My kids are better than yours. Well, my life's better than yours. Well, I can't believe. And what we do is we take our foot, put it on somebody else's else's neck and push ourselves up to try to elevate ourselves to look like something that we're not. And Jesus throws his hands up time and time again and says, stop doing it. The system that he had in mind wasn't one where we compete with each other that's vicious and malicious. It's one where we team up together so that we support each other. When somebody succeeds, we celebrate. When somebody fails, we mourn and we support. Because if all of us don't win, none of us wins. So are you, am I, preoccupied with appearing to be spiritual? Am I judgmental, exclusive, or proud? These two things go hand in hand, but I want to ask you because they're things Jesus hated. Judgmentalism. A judgmental person picks certain things, usually behaviors, and by your external behaviors, they decide whether or not you're their kind of person, whether you're worthy of church, whether you are worthy of Jesus, or whether you should be on the outside. And the thing about this judgmentalism is that unless it comes from Scripture, straight from the Word of God, it changes according to the person you're around or the church that you happen to be in. And it's impossible to figure out what standard we're supposed to live by. I had a person the other day who's not a believer, and he was around a group of us who were Christians, and we were talking about judgmentalism and just how funny it was in churches. And he said, where's the list? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, where's the list of things you can and can't do? And I said, what do you mean, what list? He goes, well, you know, I mean, where's the list? Who tells you what you can and can't do? And I said, well, the Bible's the list. And he went, huh. Because he's hearing us talk about all the lists that everybody seems to have and all these expectations and all these standards that don't come from the Word, but they come from tradition or your own preferences or your own opinions. But the list comes from the Bible. And can I share with you something, friends? The list is a lot shorter than you might think it is. We're the ones who make it complicated. Am I becoming more or less approachable to others? Approachability was one of the qualities that Jesus had that he mastered. And it's one of the indicators or barometers that let us know whether we're moving away or um, toward Christ-likeness. Am I measuring my success by superficial standards? Everybody has their own superficial standards. And are we measuring our spiritual success by those instead of how close we are to the center, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I only have a few more. Am I making worship a priority? I had a lot more than this before I weeded the list down. Am I making worship a priority? Um, I wish I could tell you it's not important. I guess I wish I could tell you that because so many people struggle in this area. When you stop coming to worship, your life begins to fall apart. Your marriage becomes a little more difficult. Your parenting becomes a little more challenging. Life doesn't make sense. You begin to struggle in ways where oftentimes you don't even know why you're struggling, but there is a direct relationship between your faithfulness and attendance in worship, not forsaking the assembly of the saints, being together, celebrating together, worshiping together, sitting under the word that God blesses and uses to make your life different. When you pull yourself away from worship, you're bringing upon yourself the consequences of disobedience. Are you committed to worship? Now, I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys are here, right? But it's really important. And I tell my kids this because I love them. And my family members this because I love them. There's no more important place for you to be on Sunday mornings than in a worship service. And I believe it goes a little further than that too because I think worship is where we start. But it's certainly not where we stop. Am I giving God control of my time? Have you found yourself saying that you're too busy to serve the Lord? Busyness is not an excuse. It may be an explanation. But if you're genuinely too busy to do the kinds of things that God is prompting you to do, then you need to rearrange your life and allow God to reprioritize or you're going to bring the punishment that comes from disobedience and miss out on the blessing that comes from having things in a right priority and order. Busyness is one of the most common excuses that we give just too busy, Lord. It just doesn't hold water. 
the hard and fast truth of it is, is we do what we want to do. We find time to do what it is we want to do. Am I making decisions based on my will and not God's? Now, the compliment to that is, am I making decisions based on my will and am I blaming it on God? Isn't it amazing and ironic how so many times when we make a decision and say, this is exactly what God wanted for me. It's exactly what we wanted for ourselves in the first place. But we spiritualize things. We make decisions sometimes not consulting the Lord or His Word. Sometimes consulting and ignoring. Sometimes blaming God, saying, I did this because God told me to. And that's one of the ways that we for sure can shipwreck our lives. God needs to inform every choice and every decision. Am I giving generously? Another hard and fast truth in the New Testament, and this is just the way it is. What we do with our money reflects the condition of our heart. If we're not giving sacrificially and joyfully to the church, to the Lord through His church, to support the things of the Lord, we're not obeying the Lord in the way that He wants us to obey Him. Where our money is, it reflects the priority of our heart, and it's impossible for us to be disciples of Christ while we withhold what it is that He's trusted us to invest for Him. That's just the truth. I love you. That's why I tell you the truth. Some of you, you're nodding your heads because you understand, but for some, you'll find blessing and freedom like you've never imagined when you relinquish that part of your life to the control of Jesus Christ. Am I living in community? Oh, I'm too busy for community. No one's too busy for community. We live a personal relationship with Jesus, but we live it in a very public way. God's created us to live in a herd. I feel like we have to be involved in a city group, in a class, smaller group settings, that we have to be plugged in in a way where we can live life with people who want the same thing that we like. Because if not, we can deceive ourselves. Am I serving selflessly? We can make everything in church about us, everything. I can make small groups about me. I can make worship about me. I can complain about music style. I can talk about coffee. I can't serve and make it about me. When I'm serving the Lord, it's never about me. It's always about the people we're serving. So a disciple of Jesus Christ serves with their time, with their thoughts, and with their money. That's just the true fact of it. And finally, am I becoming more loving? Well, these are things I've been sort of keeping track of in my own life as we've been talking together. And I want to just leave you with this thought as we close. A Great Commission Christian hears and does the Word. We don't simply study the mirror, right? But we study the mirror and we apply what the mirror reveals. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. What we do reveals our character. I want to pray for you. And I want to pray that if God has challenged you to confess something, that you'll confess it. That if He has challenged you to begin something, that you'll begin it. That if He's challenged you in your thoughts, with your time, with your finances, if He's encouraged you to take a step of faith, that you won't walk away having encountered the Word, seeing what you look like, with Christ's reflection looking back at you that you leave and forget and live the same way another day. Father, thank you for my friends.